Hello, art historians, and welcome to our first lecture over content. So we are still in unit one, where we're talking about prehistoric art, but our last lecture set the context. It set the background of what was going on in prehistoric life. What was it like for prehistoric humans? And now we're going to start looking at the pieces that the art history exam and the college board have chosen that reflect that context, that are basically like a mirror of what was going on at that time. Okay, so one thing that is super, super important to remember is that number one, we have to focus on that art is not an accident idea. In this particular case, for all of the works of art for the AP exam, they have chosen them because they do reflect intentional choices that were made on the part of the artist because of the context at the time. So it is really important for you to think about as you go through each piece, why did the college board choose this piece? What are they trying to show me about life during that time with this piece? What does it prove about history? How is this piece a mirror of history? All right. When we're talking about Paleolithic art, all right, so we're talking prehistoric art, all right? Prehistoric art is made up of, for the purposes of our class, two main time periods, Paleolithic and Neolithic. Both of those time periods are before writing took place, okay? However, Paleolithic is what we're focusing on on this particular time, and this is when people were hunter-gatherers, nomads, moving from place to place, highly dependent on animals, no writing, and before farming. Now, here's the catch with that. Because there is no writing, we don't actually know for sure what these things were for or what their original purpose was. We can only be speculative. We can make educated guesses based on the archaeological research that's been done that tells us what life was like for these people. So, for example, we know that sculptures during this time period were generally small because these are nomadic people moving from place to place. We know that females tended to be more important because that's typically when humans are shown during this time, it's primarily females. We don't 100% know why, but we can go based on the evidence that we have. And the artwork is actually evidence of that. Okay, so first of all, we have to understand that during this time period in history, we're going to have a major migration of humans out of Africa. We're going to go through an ice age. That ice age is going to mean the water levels are going to go down because a lot of that cold temperature is going to absorb the water up into ice. So therefore, people are going to be able to, people and animals are going to be able to move out of where we believe human life began, and that's in Africa. They're going to spread out to different parts of the world in this nomadic lifestyle following around the food sources. And we are going to look at the fact that no matter where they ended up, because they all shared the same kind of lifestyle, the art we're going to see is going to share some pretty strong characteristics. All right, so this is just a map to show where we are thinking or how archaeologists and anthropologists believe that these migrations took place. So out of Africa, up into Europe, across Asia, down into Australia, and then eventually over to the Americas, working their way down. Okay, so for example, this is just a really good example of the fact that because these people, when they migrated, that was their culture. They were nomadic hunter-gatherers pretty much all over the world. So these figurines, these Venus figurines, all right, which means like a goddess, were found in many, many different locations all over the world, but they share similarities, which means we're seeing that there were common values shared because of the common culture that these people shared, even if they didn't actually interact with each other. And again, they're small because we're looking at portable, the need to be able to move during these early civilization or these early nomadic groups. Okay, now these pieces, all right, are some of the ones we're gonna look at in regards to prehistoric art, except the Venus figurines, that one's not on the 250. So it's really important when the, the people who wrote the exam chose these pieces, or wrote the curriculum rather, they chose these pieces because they are very good evidence of what we know about prehistoric people, that animals were a really big deal, they were nomadic hunter-gatherers, and that they did create art for very specific purposes, even if we're not 100% sure what those are. So these are the four that we're going to be looking at, okay? 
The first one we're going to look at is the Apollo 11 stones. And the Apollo 11 stones get their name because of the cave that they were found in around the same time that the Apollo 11 mission happened to space. So you can see here that they're found way, way, way down in Africa, like really far down, which really kind of, since these are some of the oldest works of art ever dated, it really kind of helps support that hypothesis and theory that human life began in Africa. Because if human life began there and human expression began there, then we're going to see the earliest works of art that are there. And so this work of art right here, this one on the right, which you can see is kind of two slabs that kind of have that fissure, which means they used to be connected. They were found deep within a cave alongside other tools that weren't actually from that area. The materials from the tools were not from that area, which means those tools were brought in maybe through migration or whatever and used to create what they found here. And obviously they were using the caves also for shelter. Now, you can see here, this is a slab of rock. We don't actually know what type of animal this is. There's different theories about it because even though it's really hard to see, you can barely see it. There appears to be like a bison horn up here. So like there's horns on this thing, but that doesn't match up with the fact that part of it looks feline, part of it looks like something else. But we do know the legs look, the back legs are darker, look like they were added later and appear to be more human. So it's kind of this theory that maybe this was a hybrid animal and we can see different sides of it. It's in that composite view where you can see the profile of the body one way, but the feet are turned another way. And obviously it was very important to them that you see all the parts of the animal, but we're not actually 100% sure which animal it is. So they believe it may be some kind of like religious, you know, belief thing. Like maybe this was shamanistic, that maybe they were using this animal as a way to communicate with the animals or with the spirits. We're not 100% sure. What we do know is it's found very, very deep in a cave in Namibia, Africa. Oops, sorry. And again, supporting that theory that life began there, all right, because it dates back to as old as any art that they've ever found. Um, it's made of very natural materials, so quartzite stone, and then used like created using like charcoal and ochre. So ochre is you can make different colors with this. So like you can do like reds and like other like natural materials. You can powder up and mix with liquid, and you can make yellows and things like that. But very materials that were chosen that would be natural colors, like. They weren't doing this in like bright blue. They were trying to make it look like the skin and colors naturally of, you know, actual animals. And again, in composite view, showing all different parts, but most likely some kind of, kind of religious significance, especially since it's hidden deep within a cave. All right. Now, why does this keep doing this? Sorry. So one important medium you're going to hear about a lot, especially in terms of cave paintings and things like that, is red ochre. And it's basically one of the earliest types of paint that we see. And it's pretty vibrant um, that you can notice this. And again, these people use what they had in nature around them. Um, what's really cool about this, and I just learned about this recently, is that there were actually found alongside some of these cave paintings, ostrich eggs in Africa, but they were broken in half. And inside the ostrich eggs was this red ochre, which means they were probably using the eggs as like a paint container, like almost like a palette while they were painting, which I think is just super, super neat that they were that innovative back then. So we're moving from the Apollo 11 stones into cave paintings, because when we think of prehistoric art, that's the big thing that comes to mind. And that makes perfect sense because these people are going to live in caves like that's a very good place to hide from predators from the elements to keep warm to keep safe and the apollo 11 stones were found in a cave where there were other cave paintings now these cave paintings that i've shown you these three different examples these are from different places in the world um they're from all spread across afro eurasia but they do no matter where they were found share some pretty striking similarities about them all right, this is to show you, this is where cave paintings have been found. And across the board, they're pretty similar. Now you'll notice one, two, and four right there, those are in France pretty clustered together. So coming out of Africa through migrations, that would be a pretty common place to go is that particular area right there. 
So here's some things we see commonly about cave paintings that I think it's really important to recognize. No matter where they are, they're never near the front. They're always near the back, primarily because, I mean, maybe that's where they were hiding. That's where they needed to be. You wouldn't be near the front. This was about safety and shelter, or maybe they wanted to keep them secret. We're not 100% sure. They're also done on a massive scale. These were huge undertakings. Maybe it's because they had that time available, or maybe it's because this really was that important to them to take this time and do it right on a massive scale. Another commonality, humans are shown very, very simplified. They are basically stick figures, whereas if you look here, the animal, very, very, very detailed. This is obviously like a, a cartoon version of one but very, very, very detailed on the animals because the animals were the most important thing. Maybe the more natural they made them and more detailed, the more likely they would show up. And again, we just see this more commonly, if we were seeing or seeing humans that were more detailed, even if they were stylized, it was typically more females at this particular point, but that's about to change. Okay. Very important term for you to get into your brain at this particular point is the term naturalism, okay? You're going to hear the terms naturalism or naturalistic and realism or realistic a lot. And these two terms are not interchangeable, okay? You can be realistic and not be naturalistic, okay? There is a big difference, okay? Um, naturalistic means it looks like it would look in nature. Like if it was a natural thing that just developed, this is how it looks in nature. You know what a naturalistic tree looks like. You'd be like, that looks like a tree. That's that's a very naturalistic tree. I can see the, the veins on the leaves. I can see the lines and the bark. It's the right colors. It's wow, that's exactly how an elm would look, okay? Realism is you're able to recognize it. You're able to go, that's a tree. It can be blue, purple, pink, tie-dyed. That's not naturalistic. Obviously, that's not naturally how a tree looks, but you can recognize it. You can go, oh, that's, that's, that's an angel. That's a, you know, that's a, that's a tree. You can get it. It may not look anything like a tree would naturally look, but it looks like a tree. Why is this important? Because in cave paintings, you can realistically recognize that's a human, that's a buffalo, but you're going to see that the animals are way more naturalistic in their detail, like shading and color and depth and detail. It's like, man, that's, that's a buffalo. That's a, that looks like a real buffalo. But realistically, if you were like, hey, I know that's a buffalo. It's not a naturalistic buffalo, but it's a buffalo. All right. Why, what does this tell us? Okay, this is an example of a cave painting and you can see that that is so naturalistic. Realistically, you could recognize what that is, but man, that is a naturalistic looking animal right there. You can see the color is naturalistic. They use like reds and browns. They even have the curve of like the spine where it would kind of dip in a little bit. Um, you can see that it's got the the features, right? That the head isn't overblown or anything like that. It's that's how the head would look in proportion to the body. Extremely naturalistic detail. They even would go where the the cave walls kind of jutted out, and like paint over that. So it almost made it look like the ribs came out a little bit. So even more naturalistically because they wanted these to look as natural as possible. Another thing we commonly see with cave paintings is stacking, all right? Now, there's a couple reasons why we think this could happen, all right? Number one, so like stacking, like it looks like they're stacked one on top of each other. This looks like they could have just been standing in a row, like running in a line, like running in a pack. Maybe they were going for a very naturalistic appearance of that, all right? Or there's also evidence that these were added onto over time. Like these weren't just done one time. Like maybe people came in and added to them and, you know, increased the number that were there. We don't know, but we do know that it's probably one of those reasons. Okay. So for the 250, the piece that they want you to know um, comes from Lascaux, France. Like right here, you guys can see kind of where Lascaux is. 
you'll also see Altamira. Altamira is not on the 250. It's not going to be on the AP exam unless it's just a picture of a cave painting and asks you to identify what it is. But Lascaux has um, the Great Hall of the Bulls, and that's the one for the 250. So this is the Great Hall of the Bulls walking in. You can actually do a virtual tour of it. I'm going to share with you guys where you can like you can see like it's pretty hard to navigate this to get back in there. And they've actually found evidence of like trees that were used for scaffolding for them to get up there and paint these like on the ceiling, on the walls, but not down near the bottom. Like it's just kind of crazy. Why do that? Like why go through that effort unless it's kind of like some heavenly idea of if we paint them, they will come and then we will have food. But this is the Lascaux Caves, all right? And the big piece is the Great Hall of the Bulls, which is actually a misnomer because there's lots of different animals in there, not just bulls, um, but people tend to focus on the bulls. So the Lascaux Caves um, were painted on these really dry, so far towards the back, dry walls that were very uneven, which gave them this really great canvas to paint on. Really, really neat that you could get those different textures, there's lots of different animals in there, like horses, bison, elks, lions, bears. Um, there are evidence of humans. There's handprints that are on there, but they are not nearly as important. Maybe they were shamans. Maybe they were hunters. We don't really know. They went through a lot of effort to make these things look very naturalistic. They would like use their hands and like use a straw to like almost spray paint the lines using their hand is like a guideline to create those very smooth lines. Um, the ochre, the charcoal, the colors are very vibrant and very naturalistic. Um, and there is something we do see that is called hierarchy of scale. Hierarchy means something is more important than the other. So like in a hierarchy, like in our school, obviously Mr. Sink or Dr. Sink is at the head, the top of the hierarchy, like he's at the top. Scale means size, and this is basically a way of saying the more important you are, the bigger you're going to be depicted in the scene, all right? So in this case, compared to humans, the animals are massive. Um, so what was this for in terms of function? Most likely, this the biggest theory is this was shamanistic, like it was ritualistic, it was part of a religious ritual, being able to commune or contact animal spirits so that they would come for hunting. There's also the theory that this was just kind of like an encyclopedia of animal life in the area. We're not 100% sure. We can only speculate, especially based on the massive number that are within these caves. So again, how do we see that deliberate naturalism that they were really trying to make these look like the animals they actually are? The outlines, the lines are very, very thick to make sure it's very clear what they are creating. Um, using their hands as stencils, using like forming it, using different techniques, not just like painting or carving with tools, but also using the straw to kind of spray paint stacking the animals to create depth using contours of the caves like to almost make it look like where the ribs come out a little bit and using like these lines to kind of really emphasize the shapes of these animals and showing just how important they are that they took this much time and detail to make them and again we do see an awful lot of composite view in the caves which is showing the same thing from different angles. So like the head facing one way, the feet facing another, the, the body in profile. It's like twisting the, the view or the perspective so you can see as much of the animal as possible. But you can see in this picture right here, the human is nothing compared to the buffalo. So again, we don't know 100% what these cave paintings are for. Um, they could have been deep in the caves to hide them from enemies or competitors. It could have been because they were sacred in nature. Um, maybe they were just documentary, like saying this is what was happening at the time. Maybe they were bored. I don't know. All right. Um, if you want to see this, I do save it. Um, it is in the Google slide deck. And this is the scene from Ice Age where Sid and Manny and the saber tooth tiger, I can't remember his name, they're walking through a cave and they come across these cave paintings. And you can actually see that they did this right. Like you can really see it. If you want to watch the clip, it's, it's kind of, it'll really hit you in the feels though. So just as a warning. Okay. Now, 
let's talk into another or move into another cave painting that is going to be back in Africa. So we're moving that direction called the running horned woman. And it was found in Tunisia, Africa, also in a cave. And this is a transition piece. So it's got a little bit of pre like paleolithic but it's starting to move towards neolithic a little bit and i'll explain that so this was found in the 1900s in a really not easy area to access in africa so very very well hidden because this area was so close to egypt for a really long time people thought this is an egyptian goddess i think maybe isis i can't remember um, but they have proven that wrong. They're like, okay, it's obviously got to be Egyptian. No, this was actually way before that, all right? So what this shows on this cave painting, very, very detailed, is a woman. One of the defining characteristics of her as a woman um, is she does have a female body shape that's kind of stylized a little bit, but the tattooing. So the little dots you guys can see there, definitely symbolic of tattoos. And there is a belief in terms of culture that in Africa, female tattooing is pretty common, including on the face, because it's kind of this idea of if you can handle that pain, you can handle childbirth. Um, and uh, having had babies and having tattoos, I can tell you there's really no comparison between the two, but okay, good for them. Love that for them. So we're seeing here a really good example of hierarchy of scale. She is much bigger than the people below her she's dancing and we can see that because she's wearing kind of like shamanistic like she's got them on her legs on her arms on her hands that would have been used in kind of a dancing ritual the lines of them like indicate that she's moving like she's you know not standing in one spot she's wearing a huge animal headdress all right. And there's a couple of theories about that in terms of maybe it's kind of like a veil that she's able to, because she's a female shaman, she's able to see past the veil into like another world. Or maybe it's something about hoping to invoke rain clouds. Not 100% sure. So she's not running. She's actually probably dancing. All right. Most likely, again, some kind of ritual. Um, and again, it's really about conveying that idea of how important she is because the other humans are like super, super small. Um, females at this point, still important, obviously, because that's a female. Um, but we are seeing animals not really featured in this as much. So kind of a transition piece that we're starting to move out of that a little bit, um, especially with, you know, yeah, the horns, but she's almost like becoming the animal or invoking the animal or like, like calling the animal, but it's featuring her, not really the animal. So just to show you where this is located and why people, because Egypt's over here, like why they would think, okay, that's that's got to be Egyptian link. It's not. The very last piece we're going to talk about, we're going to jump all the way from Africa over to the Americas, because remember, people, nomads migrated over this direction as well, seeking warmer temperatures and a place to find animals. And the piece that we are going to look at is the camelid sacrum. People get this mixed up a lot, right? It's the camelid sacrum in the shape of a canine. So let me break that down. A camelid is like a camel or a llama. So they took a bone from a camel or llama type of animal and then shaped it, formed it to appear like a dog, okay? At least that's what it appears to be in some kind. I, this could have been, as far as they know, something to do with invoking those animal spirits, most likely some kind of animal worship or animal communication. But it is very distinct that they chose this bone from the camel because this is called the sacrum. And the sacrum holds and protects the reproductive organs, which are so important for that idea of, and remember, in these cultures, having lots of babies is not the most important part. It's the idea of the life cycle of death and then beginning again. We've been trying to figure that out forever. And the reproductive organs bring life and then life goes on and it ends and then it begins again. And it all goes in a cycle, just like we see the planets and the sun and the moon and the stars. So to them, it was a connection with like these macrocosmic forces. But it's distinct that they chose this particular bone for this. And they have found, they're like, okay, obviously somebody, those nose holes are not there naturally. Those were drilled in and they're very uniform and smooth. 
and there's some areas that are very rough and then there's areas that have been very clearly polished all right so doing that on purpose creates the appearance of this right we just don't a hundred percent know what it's for but it clearly took a lot of detail and a deliberate choice of that particular bone and it is the earliest american recorded work of art so these are the four pieces that we are going to be using and covering for paleolithic art in prehistoric art so these four pieces are all pre-farming right so the next step we're going to move into is looking at okay what happens to the art when people stop moving around and start farming and controlling their own food